Hi everyone and welcome to the Better Everyday YouTube channel. My name is Randy. So today we are going to start the second lecture in Jordan Peterson's biblical series. This one is titled Genesis 1, Chaos and Order. I really enjoyed the first lecture. I split my reaction up into four parts or I, I reacted to it slash watched it in four different sections. And so I anticipate that's what I'll do with this one as well. Somewhere between the 30 and 45 minute mark wherever there seems to be a natural kind of a break, I will stop for this reaction. And my plan is to do it um, two of them each week so that I watch this specific lecture within a two week period so it all stays together. I just can't sit and watch two and a half hours all at one time. I would have limitless interruptions and it would just be, it's more enjoyable to do it in a bit more um, digestible and um, fragments of time that work with what I'm able to do. Sorry if you hear vacuuming out there. Anyway, I am excited, so without further ado, here we go. Okay, well, I thought this time that I would actually cover some of the biblical stories. <laughs> so, and hopefully a number of them. Um, as I said last time, I'm, I'm going to go through this. I might have well, to make as coffee. As I am able to, I want to do it as complete a job as possible and of course the probability that I'll get through the entire Bible is very low mm. but we'll get through a lot of yeah. the major stories in the beginning of it and that's a good start and then you know assuming that this all goes well then maybe I'll try to do the same thing again either in the fall or next year so okay. uh, assuming I'm that everything is still working out properly next year it's a long ways away all right so um, I guess we'll start yeah so last week I, I talked to you about a line in the New Testament that was from John and it was a line that was designed to parallel the opening of Genesis and it's it's a, it's a really important line and I thought I would re-emphasize it because the Bible is a book that's been written forward and backwards in time in some sense like most books because if you write a book of course when you get to the end if you're the writer you can adjust the beginning and so on so it right. has this odd it has this appearance of linearity but it really it isn't linear it's like your god in some sense standing hmm. outside of time that's your book and you can play with time anywhere along it yeah and uh the people who put the book together or the books together uh took full advantage of that and 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 that makes the story it, it, it gives the story odd parallels in, in many, many places, in, in a very large number of places. And this is one of the major parallels, at least from the perspective of the Christian interpretation of the Bible, which of course includes the New Testament. And so there's this strange idea that um, Christ was the same factor or force that God used at the beginning of time to speak habitable order into being. And that's a very, very strange idea, you know, and it, it, it's, not, it's not something that can be just easily dismissed as superstition, partly because it's so strange. It's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't even fit the definition of like a superstitious belief. It's, it's a dreamlike belief in some sense. And what I, what I see many of the ideas in the, in the Bible as is, is these dreamlike ideas that, that under not lie our, our normative cognition and that constitute the ground from which our more articulate, articulated and, and explicit ideas have emerged. And this one's so complicated, this idea is so complicated that it's still mostly embedded in dreamlike form, but it seems to have something to do with the primacy of consciousness. And this is one of the biggest issues regarding the structure of reality, as far as I can tell, because everyone from physicists to neurobiologists debates this. There's, there's, the, the, the stumbling block for a purely objective view of the world seems to me to be consciousness. And consciousness has all sorts of strange properties. For example, it isn't obvious what constitutes time or at least duration in the absence of consciousness. And it, it isn't also easy to understand what constitutes being in the absence of consciousness because it seems to be the case. Well, if a movie is running and there's no one to watch it, I know it sounds like the tree in the forest idea, but it's, it's, it's not that idea at all. If, if a movie is watching is running and no one's watching it, in what sense is, can you say that there's even a movie running? Because the movie seems to be the experience of the movie, 
not the objective elements of the movie. And there's something about the world, at least in so far as we're in it as human beings, that is dependent on conscious experience of the world. Now, of course, you can take consciousness out of the world and say, well, if none of us were here, if there was no such thing as consciousness, then the cosmos would continue running the way it is running. But of course, it depends on what exactly you mean by the cosmos when you make a, a statement like that, because there's something about the subjective experience of reality that gives it reality. Yeah. Or at least that's one way of looking at it. And since we're all pretty enamored of our own consciousnesses, although they're painful because they define our being, it's not unreasonable to give consciousness a kind of metaphysical primacy. Now, and it's deeper than that, you know, it's deeper idea than that because there are physicists and they're not trivial physicists like, like John Wheeler, who believes that in some sense, consciousness plays a constitutive role in transforming the chaotic potential of being into the actuality of being. And he, he actually thinks about it, he's not alive anymore, but he actually thought about it as, as playing a constitutive role, you know? And then from the neurobiological perspective or from the scientific perspective, it's like consciousness is not something we understand. I, I don't think we understand it at all. It's something we can't get a handle on with our fundamental materialist philosophy. And I don't know why that is. It's, quite frustrating if you're a scientist, but it isn't clear to me that we've made any progress whatsoever in understanding consciousness, even though, well, we've been trying to understand it for hundreds of years, and, and even though psychologists and neurobiologists and so forth have really, like, put a lot of effort into understanding consciousness from a scientific perspective in the last 50 years. So, anyways, what, what it's, it seems to me is the idea that, that God used the word to, to extract order out of habitable order out of chaos at the beginning of time, which is roughly the right way of thinking about it, seems to me deeply allied with the idea that what it is that we do as human beings is, is encounter something like a formless and potential chaos. I mean, we're not omniscient, obviously, and we can't just do whatever we want, but we encounter a formless and chaotic potential. That's always what we're grappling with. And somehow we use our consciousness to give that form. And this is how people act. Like if, if you look at how they regard themselves, it's, it's how they act. Because you say things to people like, well, you should live up to your potential. When, and, and you make a case that there's something about a person that's more than what is, that yet could be if only they participated in the process properly. And everyone knows what that means. And no one acts like a mystery has been uttered when you say that. And you know, we, you can see a situation in your own life that's full of potential. You're often extremely excited when you encounter something that's full of potential because what you see is something that could be, you see a future beckoning for you that could be if only you interacted with it properly. And it activates your nervous system, right? In, in, a, in a very basic way. And we even understand how that happens to the degree that we understand how the nervous system works because the systems that mediate positive emotion, which are, governed roughly by dopamine, by the neurochemical dopamine and which have their roots way down in the ancient hypothalamus, a very, very archaic and, and fundamental part of the brain. It, that responds to potential, which is the possibility of accruing something new and valuable. It responds to potential with active movement forward and engagement. And so we're engaged in the world as potential and it looks like consciousness does that. And so there's this idea that and this is the main idea that I think is being put forth in Genesis 1. It's something like, and, and you see this in mythology, like <laughs> uh, from, from what I've been able to gather, there, there's always tracks. three causal okay. elements that make up being at the bottom of, of world mythology. And one is the formless potential that makes up being once it's interacted with, and that's generally given a feminine nature. And, and I think that's because it's like the source from which all things emerge and rise. It's something like that. It's, it's more complicated than that, but it's something like that. And then there's some kind of interpretive structure that has to grapple with that formless potential. And that's, I think that's the sort of thing that was alluded to by Immanuel Kant when, when he was criticizing the notion that all of our information comes from sense data, which would be the pure empirical perspective, right? Because when you encounter the world, you encounter it with a cognitive structure that already has shape. And yeah. so it's, it's already in you, this structure. And without that a priori structure, you wouldn't be able to take the formless potential and give it structure. And I think that's right. something, it's akin in some way to the idea of God the Father. And I'll try to develop that idea more. It's, it's, the, it's the notion that there's something 
in all of us, that transcends all of us, that's deeply structural, that's part of this ancient, well, I would say evolutionary and cultural process that enables us to grapple with the formless potential and bring forth reality, roughly speaking. And then there's the final element, and that element seems to be something like consciousness itself, the consciousness that actually inheres in the individual. So it's not only that you have a structure, it's that the structure has the capacity for action in the world. And it's like, it's, it's you're, the, you're the spirit that gives the dead structure life. It's something like that. And as far as I can tell, the Trinitarian notion that characterizes Christianity is something like, well, formless potential, which has never given a, the status of a deity in Christianity. And then the notion that there's an a priori interpretive structure that's a consequence of, of our ancient existence as, as beings. It goes back as, as far in time as you can go, the, the notion of a structure. And then the idea of a consciousness that, that is, the, is the tool of that structure and that interacts with the world and gives it and gives it reality. And that's the word, as far as I can tell. And so the notion is, is that there's a father and that's the structure and there's a son that's transcendent that characterizes consciousness itself and that it's the son, the, the speaking of the son that is the active principle that turns chaos into order. And ah, that's such a sophisticated idea as, as, as far as I'm concerned, because well, there's something about it that's at least phenomenologically accurate because you do have an interpretive structure and you couldn't understand anything without it. Your very body is an interpretive structure, right? It's been crafted over, let's say, three billion years of evolution. Without that, you wouldn't be able to perceive anything. And it's taken a lot of death and struggle and tragedy to produce you, the thing that's capable of encountering this immense chaos that surrounds us and to transform it into habitable order. And then there's the idea too, of course, that's deeply embedded in the first chapters of Genesis, which is a staggering idea, you know, and, and certainly not one that's likely that human beings were made in the image of God, both male and female were made in the image of God. And that's of course a very difficult thing to understand, partly because the God that's referred to in, the, in those chapters has a kind of polytheistic element, um, although it, it's an element that's moving rapidly towards a unified monotheism. But it's not also obvious to me why people would come up with that concept, because I don't really think that when we think about each other, we immediately think godlike. You know, the, the notion that every single human being, regardless of their peculiarities and strangenesses and sins and crimes and all of that, has something divine in them that needs to be regarded with respect and that plays an integral role at least an, analog an analogous role in the creation of habitable order out of chaos. That's a magnificent, remarkable, crazy idea. And yet we developed it. And I do firmly believe that it sits at the base of our legal system. I think it is the cornerstone of yeah. our legal system. That's the, the notion that everyone is equal before God, which is of course a completely, that's such a strange idea. It's very difficult to understand how anybody could have ever come up with that idea because the manifold differences between people are so so obvious and so evident that you could say the natural way of viewing someone is or, or human beings is in this extremely hierarchical manner where some people are contemptible and 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 easily brushed off as as pointless and pathological and and without value whatsoever and all the power accrues to a certain tiny you know aristocratic minority at the top but if you look at the way that the idea of the in individual sovereignty developed, it's clear that it unfolded over thousands and perhaps 10,000s of years before it became something firmly fixed in the imagination that each individual had something of transcendent value about them. And man, I tell you, we dispense with that idea at our serious peril. And so, and, and if you're gonna take that idea seriously, then, which you do because you act it out, because otherwise you wouldn't be law-abiding citizens, right? You act that idea out. It's it's, it's, it's firmly shared by, by everyone who, who acts in a civilized manner. The question yeah. is, why in the world do you believe it? Assuming that you believe what you act out, which I think is a really good way of fundamentally defining belief. So, all right. So, so that's the sort of idea is that there's this, this God of tradition and structure. That's, that's God the Father who uses the Son, which is more of an active force and, and, and 
primarily something that's verbal, which I also think is extremely interesting because it's associated not with thought precisely, but with speech. And I think the reason for that is, is that there's something to speech that's more than mere thought. And I think part of the reason for that is that speech is a public utterance. Yeah. And at least in, in principle, speech is something that's shaped by the existence of, of, everywhere, of everyone else, at least across time. Because yeah. when you speak, you, you, your speech is, is put forward in the world as a causal element, and it's also subject to criticism and, and, uh, and cooperation and, and mutual shaping. And so th there's an idea here too that speech is, that, that the cognitive processes that bring habitable reality out of, out of uninhabitable chaos have this collective and public element, which, which is part of the reason, by the way, that I'm an advocate of free speech, let's say above all, because I, I don't think, although it is the case, for example, in the Canadian Bill of Rights, that every single right has equal value. That's the theory, it's an idiotic theory because it's absolutely impossible for a large set of rights to have absolutely equal standards, stances. That cannot happen. There's no way that that can ever work. But that is the legal judgment. But I think it's a huge mistake because free speech has this, well, this divine quality, let's say, that you can't escape from because it's the thing that manufactures everything else. You know, it's, and so, and I do think that the, the, the dream that you could think of as encapsulated in the stories in Genesis is, is the dream by which human beings dreamed up the idea that we would now consider consciousness because you know it took us a long time to figure out the word consciousness it's yeah. not like it's bloody obvious mm -hmm. it, who knows how many thousands of years or, or or who knows what struggles we had to undertake to abstract out something like consciousness and how yeah. we had to represent that dramatically say or symbolically or in a dreamlike fashion before we could actually formulate the term and, and localize that to some degree in people. It's very sophisticated. So, so John makes the case that, well, there's, there's an emanation of God or an element of God the, the transcendent consciousness, it's something like that, that acts directly and in, in a sort of living way with the, with the underlying potential of the world. And I think that that's phenomenologically accurate. And I do think that that's the way we regard our lives. Because, you know, when you think about it too, we tend to think that what you encounter when you're looking at the world is the material world, but that isn't how you act. You do act as if you're in a place of potential and also in a place of potential that you can actually transform, which is also something extraordinarily strange, you know, because we do treat each other as if we're capable of bringing new forms into the world in some permanent manner, right? And, and we treat each other as if we have free choice and free will, and perhaps we don't, but it's certainly the case that societies that are predicated on the idea that we don't, don't do very well and societies that are predicated on the idea that we do seem to do a lot better. Plus, people tend to get very annoyed at you if you treat them like they're automatons that lack free will. There's mm -hmm. something that people find very, I would say, constraining, slave-like yeah. about that even, you know, that yeah, the, the demand that. that you don't have actual autonomy, and even worse, that you're not responsible for your choices. It's an yeah. insult to someone to suggest to them that they're not responsible for their choices. You know, you, you usually, to do that to someone from a legal perspective, you have to argue something like diminished capacity, right? Well, you're mentally ill or you don't have the intellectual capacity or, 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 you, were, or you were addled by some substance or you had a brain injury or something and that's why you're not responsible for your actions. Otherwise, yeah. part of the respect that you give to another human being is the assumption that they're responsible for their actions and some of that can be well, if you do something bad, then you're responsible for it. But part of that too is that if you do something good, you're also responsible for that. And that yeah. also seems necessary because, I mean, do you really- it's very motivating. I mean, it's gotta be more annoying than, than anything else you can imagine to strive virtuously, let's say, to produce something of extreme value and then to be treated as if that was a mere deterministic outcome and that your your actual choices had nothing to do with that. I mean, people find that sort of thing extraordinarily punishing. And so I'm willing to, you know, I mean, I know that there are debates about all these things and debates about free will and debates about the nature of consciousness, but I'm trying to take a clear view, look at how people act and how they want to be treated and then to trace it back to these old ideas to see if there's some 
if there's some metaphysical, let's say, metaphysical connection. That makes sense. So, I'm all right, so really here's how the... Sorry about that, guys. I've been really tired the last few days, so I paused it and made some coffee. Put on a cooler shirt because I don't know if you've ever sat down while tired, but if you're warmer, you're more likely to feel the tired, at least for me. Anyway, so push down my shirt and I'm ready to let's go. I'm gonna be treated and then to trace it back to these old ideas to see if there's some, if there's some metaphysical, let's say metaphysical connection. So, all right, so here's how the, here's how the book opens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, this is a hard, this is a hard, uh, what would you call, narrative section to, to get a handle on, because yeah. in order to understand it properly, you have to actually look behind it. So there, there are a lot of pieces of old stories in the Old Testament that flesh out the meaning of these lines. And, and I, can, I can give you a quick overview of it. One, one of the ideas that lurks underneath these lines, although you can't tell be, because it's in English, you have to look at the original languages. And, and of course, I don't speak the original languages, so I've had to use secondary sources. Too, too bad for me. Yeah. But the, the, the uh, without form and void and the deep idea, you see, that's associated with this notion of endless deep potential. So for example, the words that are used to represent without form and void are something like, well, one is to, I'm gonna get this partly wrong, tohu wa bohu, and another one is teom. And it's important to know this because those words are associated with an early Mes earlier Mesopotamian word, which is tiamat. And tiamat was a dragon-like creature who represented the salt water. And, and Tiamat had a husband named Apsu, and Tiamat and Apsu were sort of locked together in kind of a sexual embrace. And it was that locking together of Tiamat and Apsu, and that, I would say that's potential and order, something like that, or chaos and order. They were locked together, and it was that union of chaos and order that gave rise in the old Mesopotamian myth, which is the Enuma Elish, to, the, to, the, to being, to the old gods first, and then eventually as, as creation progressed to human beings themselves. And so there's this idea lurking Most of underneath this, these initial lines that God is akin to that which confronts the unknown and carves it into pieces and makes the world out of its pieces. And the thing that it confronts is something like a, well, it's something like a predatory reptile or it's something like a dragon or it's something like a serpent. And I think part of the reason for that, and, and this, this, is, this is a very deep and ancient idea, is that this is where it gets so complicated to do the translation, is partly that is how human beings created our world. Like we went out beyond the con confines of our safe spaces, let's say, our space, <laughs> our safe spaces defined by, by the tree or defined by the fire, and we actively voyaged outward to the places that we were afraid of and didn't understand and, and, con and, and conquered and encountered things out there, like, like, an like literally animals, like mammoths and snakes and predators of all sorts. And it was a, as a consequence of that active, brave engagement with the domain of what we did not understand, the terrifying domain of what we did not understand, that the world in fact was generated. And that idea lurks deeply inside the, the opening lines of, of Genesis. And it's, a, and it's a profound idea in my estimation. And I think, see, I think also that the way our brains are structured, and this is something that I'm going to try to develop more today, is that the ancient circuits that our ancestors used to deal with the space beyond which they had already explored, so that would be home territory. That, so that's that unknown territory that's, that's characterized by promise because there are new things out there, but also by intense danger, right? Because we're prey animals, especially millions of years ago when we were very young, we had to go out there and encounter things that were terribly dangerous. And there was a kind of, let's say, paternal courage that went along with that. Yeah. And it was that the spirit of paternal courage that enabled the conquering of the unknown. And there's no difference between the conquering of the unknown and the creation of habitable, habitable order. And the thing is, is that as our cognitive faculties have developed to the point where we're, we're, we're capable of very high levels of abstraction, the underlying biological architecture has remained the same. And so I, I don't think that it's too much to say at all that the, 
The circuits that you that engage you, for example, when you're having an argument about something fundamental with someone that you love, and so you're trying to structure the world around you jointly to create a habitable space that you can both exist within, you're using the same circuits, the, the abstracted version, you're using the same circuits that our archaic ancestors would have used when they went out into the unknown itself to encounter beasts and, and, and predators and, and, and geographical unknowns. It's the same circuit. That's an it's just that we do it abstractly it. now instead of concretely. But of course it has to be the same circuit because evolutionary, evolutionary is, is a very conservative force. And what else would it be? And this is also why I think it's so easy for us to demonize those people who are our enemies, because mm -hmm. our enemies confront us with what we don't want to, with what we don't want to see. And they, they, and because of that, our first response is to use snake circuitry, snake detection circuitry on them, and that accounts for our capacity, almost immediate capacity, to demonize. And, and, and there's a reason for that. It's not a trivial thing. First of all, it's a very fast response. And second of all, it's a response that has worked for a very, very, very long time. Oh, it does. And so, Look at politics. you know, one of the <laughs> variants of the hero, and, and I would consider a variant of the hero, uh, uh, like a fragment of the picture of God is, is the heroic warrior who slays the enemy, right? And of course, that's not precisely a politically correct representation of the hero in modern times. And, well, and no wonder, but it's still something that you go watch in movies all the time and mm. admire, right? It's, it's like yeah. this one of the most, how many plots are there? Romance and adventure, that's about it. And <laughs> most of the adventure uh, genre is well, there's some enemy that's lurking in some form. It could be human, it could be alien, and someone rises up to go and confront it and maintain order, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, there's no getting away from that story. And, and if you don't have that I've in your own life, then like you, you play a video game where that's happening, or you watch a movie mm -hmm. where that's happening, or you read a book where that's happening, and it captures you, even if you're atheistic and your only religion is Star Wars, you know? <laughs> and, and it, I want to pause just to say, I never really thought too much into movies. I don't really watch romance movies that much. I like action, especially, uh, well, you know, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I've never really thought of movie plots in a way that simplifies them like that. And now it's making me think that, think back to a lot of movies, I won't say all movies, but a lot of movies, and kind of the underlying, premi underlying premise of a lot of the movies I've seen or a lot of the movies I like is a person or a group trying to make order out of chaos, like what, with him pointing it out, now I see that. Um, just thinking about a couple of movies that I really, really like off the top of my head, Boondock Saints is my favorite. Um, the Patriot, and of course now I'm going to forget other ones. Oh, what is that one? Oh my goodness, Die Hard, that one's good. I haven't watched any of them in a while. But as far as movies that I could watch anytime, Big Daddy, those those movies, um, it's like there's just chaos, and then the people in the movie are trying to mitigate the, the chaos and control it. And now I feel like as I watch movies, I'm going to have that in the back of my mind. You're atheistic and your only religion is Star Wars, Star Wars. you know? Like and, Star Wars. And it's still, well, really, really, right? It, it, it really, it still captures your imagination and you act like someone who's possessed by religious fervor when you line up for three days to be the first one into the theater, you know? And, and all the while claiming that you're atheistic to the core. It's like, <laughs> Okay, so Star this, Wars this without form and void is this chaotic, and it's a, it's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to get a grip on, you know, what exactly this means. But I can give you a, another kind of example of how you would experience the formless chaos of potential in your own lives, and and even how the order that you currently inhabit can dissolve into that. And you know, in Dante's. Um, Inferno. Isn't that a book? When he outlined the levels of hell. Dante's Inferno. So Dante was trying I've to get to the it. bottom of what constituted evil, really, in, in, in this representation. Hmm. So it's a work of psychology, and he was thinking, well, there, there are various ways to behave reprehensibly, but there's a hierarchy of re reprehensible behavior, and there's something absolutely the worst at the bottom. And, hmm. and 
and Dante believed that it was betrayal. And, and I think that's right, because, you know, one of the things that enables uh, long-term cooperation, peaceful cooperation between people is trust. And I would also say that trust is the fundamental natural resource. Uh, there's been some very good books written on the economic utility of trust, for example, and societies where the default economic presupposition between trading partners is trust tend to be rich, even if they don't have any natural resources. And you can see that, for example, with what happened with eBay, which I think was a kind of miracle, eBay because awesome. what should have happened with eBay it's was that awesome. you sent me junk and I sent you a check that bounced, right? And, and that was the end of eBay. Yeah. But I mean, that did happen. Right, right, exactly. But that isn't what happened. Like the default, the default transaction on eBay was so honest yeah. that the brokers, you could hire brokers to begin with, I, I can't remember what they were called exactly, but you could pay someone a fee so that they would guarantee the transaction. So, you know, you wouldn't send me junk and I'd actually send you a payment and we'd pay 10% for someone to guarantee that. The default trade was so honest that those things vanished right away. Yeah. And so that meant that all this frozen capital, roughly speaking, which were all the junk that people had lying around that someone else might want, instantly became money. And mm -hmm. the only reason that worked was because people trusted one another. And so trust is, is, is an unbelievably powerful economic force, maybe the most powerful economic force. Anyways, if you have a relationship with someone, it's predicated on trust. And part of the reason for that is that Trust is what enables us to look at each other without running away screaming. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that if I trust you, then I don't have to take into account how complicated you are because you're horribly complicated. You know, I think mm. chimpanzee full of snakes, that's what a human being is. <laughs> and, and as long as you'll do what you say you'll do, yeah. then I can take you at your word and your word simplifies you. Yeah. And you can take me at my word and my word simplifies you and then we can act like we understand each other even though we don't yeah but then if that trust is betrayed then all the snakes come forth very very rapidly and so you, you, all of you i suspect have been betrayed one way or another and so what happens if, if you're in a relationship with someone and you trust them then you make certain assumptions about the past and you make certain assumptions about the present and you make certain assumptions about the future and everything's stable and so you're standing on solid ground and, and the chaos, it's like you're standing on thin ice. The chaos is hidden. The, the shark beneath the waves isn't there. You're, you're safe, you're in the lifeboat. Yeah. But then if the person betrays you, like if you're in an intimate relationship and the person has an affair and you find out about it, then, then you think one moment you're one place, right? You're, you're where everything is secure because you've predicated your perception of the world on the axiom of trust. And the next second, really, the next second, you're in a completely different place. And not only is that place different right now, the place you were years ago is different and the place you're gonna be in the future years hence is different. And so all of that certainty, that strange certainty that you inhabit can collapse into incredible complexity. And you say, yeah. well, if someone betrays you, you think, well, okay, who were you? Because you weren't who I thought you were. And yeah. I thought I knew you, but I didn't know you at all. And I never knew you. And so all the things we did together, those weren't the things that I thought were yeah. happening. Something else was happening and you're, you were someone else. And that means I'm someone else because I thought I knew what was going on. And clearly I don't, I'm some sort of blind sucker or the, or the victim of a psychopath or someone who's so naive that they can barely live. And I don't understand anything about human beings and I don't understand anything about myself. And I have no idea where I am now. I thought I was at home, but I'm not, I'm in a house and it's full of strangers and I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow or next week or next year. It's like all of that certainty, that habitable certainty collapses right back into the potential from which it emerged. And that's a terrifying thing. That's a journey to the underworld from a mythological perspective. And that is really something worth knowing yeah. because you know, journeys to the underworld are extraordinarily common in mythological stories. And you know, like the Hobbit going out to find the smog the, the dragon and, yeah. and get the gold is a journey into the underworld and journeys to the underworld happen all the time and modern people don't understand what the underworld is except that we've all been there and we go there all the time and we go there every time the solidity and stability of the world that we've erected at least partly through our speech is shattered because well some sort of snake appears that's another way of thinking about it and it's a really good way of thinking about it because you know, no matter how carefully you construct the little habitable area that's around you, there's always something you didn't take into account and there's always something 
that can pop up its head and do you in and yeah. make you aware of your mortality and, and age you for that matter or even kill you. Yeah. And that's the permanent that's the permanent situation of life, which is part of the reason why I think the story of Adam and Eve, for example, is archetypal. It's because we do inhabit walled gardens, right? Because a walled garden is half structure society and half nature. That's what a walled garden is. And a walled garden is a place of, 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 of paradise and warmth and, 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 and love and, and, and sustenance, but it's also the place where something can pop up at any moment and knock you out of it. And I think part of the reason that that story exists at the beginning of this collection of books is because it explains the eternal situation of human beings. We're always in that situation. We're in a walled garden, or we bloody well hope we are, but there's always a snake. And then it's even worse because if there is a snake, we're exactly the sort of creatures who are gonna do nothing, but go and interact with that snake the second that we can manage it, you know? It's, it's definitely the case that if you want a human being to muck around with something, the best thing to do is to tell them not ever to do it, have anything to do with it, which is, yeah. of course, something you know if you have teenagers <laughs> or not even yet. children or, or if you know anything about yourself or your partner. So these stories are trying to express what you might describe as an unchanging, transcendent reality. You know, it's... It's something like what's common across all human experience across all time. And that's what Jung essentially meant by an archetype. And you could say, well, you know, we tend to think that what we see with our senses is real. And of course that's true, but what we see with our senses is what's real that works at the time frame that we exist in, right? And so yeah. we see things that we can touch and pick up. We with see the tools of essentially that are useful for our moment to moment activities. We don't see the structures of eternity, especially mm. not the abstract structures of eternity. We have to imagine those with our imagination. Well, and that's partly what these stories are doing. They're saying, well, there's, there's forms of stability that transcend our capacity to observe, which is hardly surprising. We know that if we're scientists, right? Because we're always abstracting out things that we can't immediately observe. Yeah. But there are metaphysical or moral realities or phenomenological realities that have the same nature that you can't see them in your life by, by observing them with your senses but you can imagine them with your imagination and those, sometimes the things that you imagine with your imagination are more real than the things that you see well, numbers are like that for example i mean there's there's endless examples of that and yeah i would say well this is also a good way of thinking about fiction because a good work of fiction is more real than the stories from which it was derived. Otherwise it has no staying power, right? It's distilled reality, even though in some sense it never happened. It's like, well, it depends on what you mean by happened. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a pattern that repeats in many, many places with variation. You extract out the central pattern. It's, it's the pattern purely never existed in any specific form. But the fact that you've pulled a pattern out from all those exemplars means that you've extracted something real. And I think the reason that the, the uh, story of Adam and Eve, which we'll talk about in quite a bit of detail today, has, has been immune to being forgotten is because it says things about the nature of the human condition that are always true. I, I can give you another brief example. You know, like people have a lot of guilt. You know, there, there's a line of social psychology that claims that most people feel that they're better than other people. And like, I just don't buy that. That isn't what I've seen in my life. And maybe it's I'm a bit biased because I'm a clinical mm -hmm. psychologist and I see more people who are overtly suffering, maybe, than people do in general. Although I'm not so sure about that, you know, because you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface of most people's lives before you find something truly tragic. And, and I don't mean the sort of tragedy that, that you whine about. I mean, you know, your mother has Alzheimer's or, or your, your best friend committed suicide or you have a close relative with cancer, or you have a sick child or, you know, there's something wrong with you because almost everyone has at least one really terrible thing wrong with them. And if you don't, hey, you will. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, so, so that, that, that tragic sense of being is there with people all the time. And, and, and it's also the case that, that my, in my experience, like I rarely meet someone who says, hey, you know, I'm doing everything I possibly can. I'm a hell of a guy and I can't see how I could possibly improve. You know, you, you, meet, you meet someone like that, you think they're narcissistic, right? And you're right. And, but, but most people don't feel that way. They feel like 
they could do a hell of a lot better than they are. And they're quite acutely aware of their faults and they don't feel that they're what they should be. And you see, what happens in the story of Adam and Eve as well is that when people become self-conscious, at least that's how it looks to me, they get thrown out of paradise and then they're in history. And history is a place where there's pain in childbirth and where you're dominated by your mate and where you have to toil like mad, like no other animal because you're aware of the future. You have to work and sacrifice the joys of the present for the future constantly and you know you're going to die and you have all that weight on you. And to me again, that's just, how can anything be more true than that? That's just, as far as I can tell, that's just how it is for, unless you're naive beyond comprehension, there's something about your life that, that, that is echoed in, in that representation and why it is that, I mean, we're such strange creatures because we don't seem to really fit into being in some sense. And that's also what's expressed in the notion of the fall. We, the existentialist said, well, people feel like they have a, a debt that they have to pay off to existence for the, for the crime of their, for the crime of their being something like that and, and maybe it's because we're acutely aware that we have to offer something of value to the people around us so that they can tolerate us you know while we're, we're going about our business but it seems deeper than that is that human beings seem to exist in a post cataclysmic world and that's exactly also what's represented in genesis and it's very interesting because you know there's in the adam and eve story there's two there's two catastrophes, essentially. There's the catastrophe that occurs when Adam and Eve wake up, which we'll talk about in detail, and become self-conscious and, and know that they're naked. Yeah. That, and, and, and their eyes are open, right? So that's the terminology that's used. And to have your eyes open means to have an, an increment in consciousness, essentially, because eyes are associated with consciousness for human beings because we're intensely visual animals. And so the metaphor of having your eyes opened means is the same as the metaphor of coming to consciousness and as soon as Adam and Eve come to consciousness they realize they're naked and you know the classic interpretation of that is that it has something to do with sexual sin and I, I don't I don't believe that I, I, I don't believe that that's what it means although, although there are elements about that that are relevant it's more that to realize that you're naked it's like you're you know if, if you dream that you're naked and on a stage in front of people that's not a sexual dream man unless you're some kind of strange exhibitionist right <laughs> it's it's you want to cover yourself up and get the hell off that stage as fast as possible yeah and so to be naked in front of a crowd is to have everyone it's to have the judgment of the social world focused on your self-evident inadequacies yeah and that makes people self-conscious and that that's a real human state it's associated with neuroticism in, in the big five trait model but people don't like that at all they don't like having their fragility and vulnerability exposed to the group yeah. it's one of the two major fears of people because one is social humiliation and the other is something like mortality and death and like <laughs> your your typical agoraphobic for example, gets to have both those fears at the same time because she, it's usually a she, tends to believe she's going to have a very spectacular and exhibitionistic heart attack in a public place and make a terrible fool of herself while she's dying. So, and then that's a good example of, of the two archetypal fears that characterize, characterize human beings. Mm. So, so to me, and I said that I tried to approach these stories as if I didn't know what they were about, because that seemed the right captions to me. Go? Because they're mysteries, they're... The captions stopped. Oh no. Captions help me. As if I didn't know what they were about, because that seemed right to me. Because they're mysteries, they're... Everything about them is mysterious, and why we have them is mysterious, and what the hell you're all doing here is mysterious, you know, listening to this lecture, and so... And reading Jung, because Jung, Carl Jung, was very, very helpful in this because he, he faced these stories with a beginner's mind and presumed there was something to him that he didn't understand, given that they were at the very bloody bottom of our civilization, you know, which is historically perfectly clear, and that they came out of the midst of time. And he wasn't satisfied with the idea, the Freudian idea that God was just the father or the Marxist idea that religion was the opiate of the masses. It's like if religion was the opiate of, of the masses, then um, communism was the methamphetamine of the masses. I can tell you that. So. <laughs> So, you know, you've been betrayed by someone and so you fall into that underworld of, 
of, of doubt about everything. And it's a serious place to be in that underworld, eh? Because not only do you not know a. where you came from or who you are or where you're going, that's bad enough. So that's the underworld itself. But there's a subdivision of the underworld, like the worst suburb, which is, I think, what hell is, essentially, from a metaphysical perspective. Because, you know, if someone really cuts you off at the knees, especially if they do it in a malevolent way, and, and if you're going to be betrayed and you really want to be betrayed properly, you want to be betrayed by someone who's really out to hurt you. You know, they just weren't being stupid. They were like after you for whatever reason. And then that's also you plunge into that underworld space. And that's also when you start to nurse feelings of resentment and aggrievement and murder and homicide and even worse, you know, because if people are betrayed enough, they start they start to obsess about the utility of being itself and perhaps go to places that no one would ever want to go if they were in their right mind and to and to develop and nurse fantasies of the ultimate revenge and that's a horrible place to be and that's hell yeah. as far as I can tell and that's why hell has always been a suburb of the underworld because if if you get plunged into a situation that you don't understand and things are not good for you anymore it's one step from being completely confused it's only one step from being completely confused to being completely outraged and resentful and then it's only one step from there to really looking for revenge and yeah. that can take you places that well that that merely to imagine properly can be traumatic and i've seen that happen with people many times and i think that anybody who uses their imagination on themselves can see how that happens because i don't imagine there's a single person in the room that hasn't nursed fairly intense fantasies of revenge at least at one point in their life and usually you know for what appear to be good reasons it's no picnic to get betrayed that's for sure and it can shake your faith in being but it, if it shakes it so badly that you turn against being itself that's certainly no solution that's for sure all it does is make everything that's bad even worse yeah so okay now so and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. And so that's that's another that's another fundamental separation, right? Light and darkness. Those are those are in some sense the two fundamental two of the fundamental elements of our conscious being because of course when when it's light we're awake and conscious because we're diurnal animals and when it's night well then we're asleep and so our 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 existence is bounded by light and darkness. We're we're up and alert when it's light and that's partly because we're highly visual animals, right? Unlike most animals, because most animals use smell, we, we use vision. We're very strange that way. And vision is associated with enlightenment and illumination and with the breaking of the dawn and with the coming of the new day and, and all of that. So, and so for, for light to be created is, is, is associated in some sense with the emergence of conscious being. And so that's another echo of that notion. And there, the, the particular phrasing of the, of the story also is important because it's again that God said right so that's the use of that word and that's the active element of the structure that gives rise to that gives order to chaos it's something like that so it's this it's like the spirit of the structure manifests itself and and produces the fundamental divisions of experience that's what's being presented here and God separated the light from the dark. I'm gonna pause it. Called the light day and with it being at minute forty-five, we are almost a third of the way through this lecture. So when I record the next part, back it up a teeny bit. So when I sit down to record the next part, which will either be Thursday or Friday, um, instead of going through the halfway mark, I may go through the two-thirds mark, so that next week, for example, I could finish it just because. It's really close as far as whether I watch it in three frag three sections or or four sections. Three sections, I think, about 50 minutes per section. And if separating it into four sections, it's like around 40 minutes, I think. So it's not a huge difference between the two. Um, I enjoy that. There are some things that he brings up or discusses where even though I hear him, I'm not able to keep up on the intellectual level with every single thing but for the most part I am able to follow what he's saying and I really liked his suggestion that the Garden of Eden is somewhat symbolic to uh, the constant human state of uh, 
whatever situation you're in, you are in a walled garden, so to speak, in your life and what you perceive to be your life and the things around you. But something like a betrayal or whatever it may be could then open your eyes, so to speak, and you might see that it wasn't so perfect after all. There were things that you weren't aware of before. I might be going too far into it, but that's just a really interesting. I've never heard that before. Of course, I'm familiar with the Garden of Eden story, um, but I've never heard it discussed quite like that. And I've certainly never heard the Bible uh, so far. He's mentioning um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, verse two, as well as Adam and Eve story. And I've never heard them kind of put in a I don't even know what the word would be, but discussed the way that Jordan Peterson is discussing them. I'm finding it very interesting. I'm enjoying it. Um, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.